Hello guys and welcome as always to Let's Talk About It. On today's episode we're going to be talking about the subject of houses of horror. So no matter what you do or where you're from your home should be your sanctuary. It should be a place that you feel safe and secure and where only good things happen. But unfortunately for many people around the world that's not the case. And so here are some examples for you of houses that had some horrific things happen within their walls. The first house of horror on our list is a building known officially as the H.H. Holmes Hotel, which was built between 1887 and 1892. This was a three-storey, 100-room, block-wide building with shops on the first floor and apartments on the third floor. Nothing of any particular note there until you learn who owned the H.H. Holmes Hotel because the owner and designer of the building was none other than Henry Howard Holmes, America's first serial killer, which should give you a good idea as to why this hotel became known as the Murder Castle. Whilst the layout of the first and third floors of this Chicago-based property are normal, it's the layout and design of the second floor that sheds light on the levels in which H.H. Holmes went to in order to satisfy his murderous intent. Because the design of the second floor, for which Holmes employed various architects and building companies along the way to avoid questions being asked, is filled with things such as trapdoors, gas chambers, staircases that lead to nowhere, doors that only open from the outside, cremation areas, maze tunnels and false walls. Now, obviously, None of these design features have any place in a hotel other than to inflict maximum pain and suffering on the victims of H.H. H. Holmes who used his hotel as his personal playground of torture and torment. Something which became somewhat distorted public knowledge after Holmes was arrested in 1894 after a tip-off from a fellow con man, Marion Hedgepath, whom Holmes had scammed out of a vast amount of money. This then led to a search of the H.H. H. Holmes Hotel, during which police found disturbing things such as single-person chambers under the floorboards, soundproof iron-walled rooms, blood-soaked operating tables in the basement, acid baths, and piles of human bones. And so, as you would imagine, Holmes was arrested, and in 1896 he was executed by hanging. Officially, he was sentenced to death for the murder of his business partner, Benjamin Pitzel, and his children, whom Holmes killed as part of an insurance scam. However, on more than one occasion, Holmes had confessed to the murders of 27 other men, women and children. However, due to his conflicting confessions along the way, some of the victims being found alive and well, and historical evidence, Holmes could not be charged with any other murder making his real number of victims, which is argued to be anywhere between 9 and 200 people, and H.H. H. Holmes himself, as mysterious as the murder castle he built. The next house of horrors can be found in Villisca, Iowa, where eight people, six of them being children, were brutally murdered with an axe, giving this story the name the Villisca Axe Murders. The crime in question took place at midnight on June 10th, 1912, when a mystery man broke into the home of Joe and Sarah Moore. Whilst Mr and Mrs Moore slept, their four children, Herman, Catherine, Boyd and Paul, doing the same in a room down the hall, the unknown man stalked the house with an oil lamp in one hand and an axe in the other. With a seeming knowledge of the layout and exactly where people would be, he first murdered Joe and Sarah by attacking them with his axe with such force and repetition that both bodies were left unrecognisable. The same fate was then inflicted on all four of the Moore's children, and then, in a terrible case of wrong place, wrong time, two young girls, the Stillinger sisters who had come for a sleepover, were also murdered with the axe. Now, to make things even more unnerving, the killer wrapped each victim's face with clothing, covered all the mirrors in the house with sheets, and left a two pound piece of uncooked bacon in the living room along with a bowl of bloody water in which the killer washed his hands. After the killer was done, he took the keys from the house, left and locked the door behind him. 
It was only then in the morning that Joe Moore's brother, Ross, entered the house with his own key and discovered the gruesome scene, after which he, of course, alerted the authorities. As news of the brutal mass murder spread through Villisca, the townsfolk arrived at the house and with shameful disregard for the victims, they entered en masse to see the gruesome results for themselves, resulting in the destruction of any potential evidence and also destroying any leads the police may have had to finding the killer. Because this is a crime that has never been solved, which is not to say that there were not several suspects along the way. One such suspect was a man named Frank F. Jones, who was a prominent Villisca resident and also a Iowa state senator. His motivation for the crime is said to come from Joe Moore opening up a rival implement company in 1908. And to add further fuel to that fire, it is speculated that Joe Moore was having an affair with Frank's daughter-in-law. Based on those motivations and Frank F. Jones's status, it is said that he either hired a hitman to murder the Moore's family or he committed the murders himself. However, there was no evidence to support this, so of course no arrest was ever made. Another suspect was a man named Lynn George Jack and Kelly who had a history of sexual deviance and mental health issues. Based on this, the authorities had labelled Lynn as the most likely candidate to have committed the crime. An accusation that was backed up by Lynn's known history of watching the Moore's family, the bloodstained clothes that he took to a cleaners the day after the murders, and the fact that Lynn was left-handed, which the axe killer was also said to be. And if that wasn't bad enough for Lynn, he then tried to con his way into the murder house by pretending to be a Scotland Yard police officer. And so, of course, he was arrested. He then confessed to the crimes. However, almost immediately, he recanted his confession claiming that he was forced into it through police brutality. With this knowledge, the jury at his trial refused to sentence him. And so, with no evidence or witnesses to the crime itself, the Villisca Act murders, over 100 years later, remain completely unsolved. Meaning that the man with the oil lamp and the axe got away with murder. The final story I have for you today is that of the infamous Brothers Home a South Korean welfare facility that operated between 1976 and 1987. The Brothers Home, as with other facilities, was set up as part of the South Korean Social Purification Project that began in 1975. As part of this, welfare facilities earned subsidies for each person they took in and the police were rewarded for purifying the streets, which unfortunately led to corruption of the system. And then, in 1981, the project was ramped up when then-president of South Korea, Chun Hu Duan, ordered then-Prime Minister Nam Duk Woo to crack down on beggars, vagrants and the less desirables, which included orphans and disabled people, from polluting the streets of South Korea. And so, putting wealth above anything else, those running Brothers Home, Park In Kian and his wife Lim Young Soon, along with their family members, committed some of the worst atrocities in the history of post-war South Korea. Because the Brothers Home was anything but the welfare facility it was meant to be, with survivors of their time there comparing it to a Nazi concentration camp. Victims of the abhorrent crimes were often people, many of them being children, who were snatched from the streets and forced into slave labour within the confines of the Brothers Home where inmates were stripped of both their dignity and their identity, which was replaced with numbers as part of the brutal military rule that was inflicted upon them. Those kidnaps were starved or forced to eat rotting food. They had to work hour after hour in one of the on-site factories. They were beaten, they were tortured, and they were subjected to extreme sexual violence. And many inmates lost their lives due to non-compliance or trying to escape after which they were brutally beaten to death in front of their fellow inmates. And then, in 1986, after years of the depravity that happened at the brothers' home, an investigation was launched by a local prosecutor named Kim Young-won, who gathered enough evidence to convince local authorities to raid the brothers' home. On doing so, they first discovered the appalling conditions that people were being forced to live in, evidence of the torture and brutality being inflicted upon people, 
and in a safe they found the rough equivalent of four million pounds in today's money. Profits that were entirely made from the exploitation of these innocent people. And then in 1987, Park In Kian was sentenced. But the man in charge of the brothers' home wasn't sentenced for torture or kidnapping or murder. He was sentenced for embezzlement, for which he served only two and a half years in prison, with no real punishments being handed out for the death of a minimum of 551 people and thousands more who were trafficked and exploited by the brothers' home. Well, guys, that brings me to the end of another video. If you got something out of it, I'd really appreciate if you could hit the like button. If you haven't already, I'd love it if you could hit the subscribe button. Otherwise, leave the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.